Hey everybody, uh, good afternoon. Thanks for joining me this afternoon in Seattle. Uh, my name is Jen Madriaga. I am the Senior Manager for Global Community Event Strategy at Red Hat. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'm really, really glad to talk to you today about the journey around creating an employee resource group, the Red Hat Asian Network. So just want to give a little bit of context to um, the Asian Network. It's a very, very young um, ERG. Uh, it actually just launched this past February um, this year. Um, the genesis of this group, though, started uh, a little bit over a year ago uh, when we started talking um, with people within the leadership team uh, within DNI uh, at Red Hat about forming a community. And the main driver for creating this community um, was because there was a lack of an official entity at Red Hat um, to support Asian American as associates um, because there was a lot obviously going on with COVID-19, um, including a charged political climate, um, increased incidences of harassment and violence, um, a lot of which were targeted towards the elderly, and the corresponding negative effect on mental and social health. Um, and so a few of us were looking to see if there are any places where we could have um, a conversation with each other about the things that were affecting us. And so we found each other uh, really through serendipity. There were five of us uh, that came together that decided that we wanted to get this done. So the founding committee, like I said, is composed of five people. Um, I'm one of the five people. Uh, I am of Filipino descent. My great grandfather came to the United States um, through Hawaii as a sugar plantation worker. Uh, Robin Chan, who is my co-chair, um, I believe is seventh generation Japanese American. Uh, Laura Fu uh, is half Chinese, half German Irish, and she grew up in Michigan. Um, Joe Tsai is of Taiwanese descent. Uh, he immigrated over to North Carolina, grew up here in the United States, but spent 15 years abroad in Japan before returning back to the United States. And then we had Tesh Patel, who grew up in the UK, is of, it, of Indian descent. Um, and that rounds up the five people that were in this group. Um, we also retain an executive sponsor, Helen Kim, uh, who is actually a Korean American that lives in Singapore. And she is our current vice president of marketing for APAC. So the five of us came together and really, the, the reasons are really, really personal for us. Um, this group was not driven by any initiative um, by Red Hat. This was completely driven by us, um, by employees that were really concerned about the fact that we were feeling isolated in our teams, um, and that you know who could we turn to to talk about the things that were weighing on us. And they were weighing on us and affecting us in the workplace because the past year demonstrated that the line between the workplace and home life um, is pretty much not there anymore. And um, as a result of everything that was happening around the pandemic and all the other conversations um, that were happening related to diversity, equity, uh, inclusion, and justice, um, uh, such as the things that were going around George Floyd, um, we felt very, very compelled to act on those things um, because we actually felt like it was the right thing to do. So I'm going to go through the next couple slides pretty quickly. So we have a mission statement. Um, so the Red Hat Asian Network is actually open to people who, are, who identify as part of the Asian diaspora, um, but we also uh, include allies uh, to join us. In fact, a really large number of folks that are part of the Asian network are actually allies. Um, and as I said, if you identify the Asian diaspora or want to learn more about the Asian diaspora, we welcome you. And the Asian diaspora actually encompasses pretty much all of Asia. So we do East Asian, Southeast Asian, South Asian, Central Asian, and Pacific Islander identity. And I will go a little bit uh, into the ins and outs, the challenges of creating this organization and also trying to be as inclusive as possible um, as we scale this organization. 
Um, so the ultimate goal for this group is really just to have a space to gather, right? It's a space um, we can, where we can address the needs of all associates. Um, full disclosure, all the current leadership at the Asian Network is currently um, here in the United States and specifically within North Carolina. Um, so we identify as the North American chapter of the Asian Network. Um, we do have associates from around the world, um, from EMEA, from LATAM, and APAC that uh, participate in our organization. Um, but we have a particular emphasis currently on North America and specifically the United States. And the next few slides will explain why we have that emphasis. One, it's because we're a volunteer organization. Uh, and two, we could speak best to the uh, concerns of associates that are in the United States. However, we do engage in conversations, as I said, with associates in all regions, and we try to um, support the best we can. Um, and a large part of how we, are, we want to move forward in terms of advocacy is actually through efforts and intersectionality. And so I'll talk a little bit more about our efforts and in intersectionality in just a bit. So we were asked to present a business case um, to senior leadership about why we would need an employee resource group um, for Red Hatters of Asian Heritage. And it you know, may be surprising if folks, Red Hat's been around uh, for uh, close to 30 years now, almost as long as Linux has been around. And it seemed kind of surprising, like why wouldn't a tech company have an ERG actually uh, dedicated to the Asian diaspora? Um, and so that was something that we had to justify. We had to justify why we would have a group um, for folks who are of Asian descent. Um, so we just you know, went through some stats. Of course, Asians are still very much a minority within the American population, about 6% of the US population, but we actually do um, have a fair number of software jobs. I will explain, though, how Red Hat is an outlier um, in the tech industry in just a moment. Um, so this is for tech in general, but not specific to Red Hat. Um, we are the largest underrepresented group within Red Hat. If you look at the Asian diaspora, um, we're the largest. But then again, I'm going to explain a caveat uh, attached to that. Um, and then the other thing is that we're greatly underrepresented in tech leadership. In fact, Asian American women are the least likely to be promoted into management roles. Um, so there are several things that we presented to senior leadership about like why we wanted um, to have a group dedicated to that. So this is uh, not a secret. This is actually on the redhat.com uh, website. But this is our breakdown of the population at Red Hat by um, ethnicity and race. And so you can see that I put a little red box um, around uh, the Asian grouping. Um, it says that it's only in the US. So in other countries, it's actually not legal to track um, people. Um, by race or gender. So these are statistics that speak um, to the United States. But you'll see that the percentage is 12%. Um, Hispanic, Latino is 5%. Black is 4%. And then are 2 percent is two plus races. 1% is other. That includes um, folks that may identify as Pacific Islander uh, and perhaps Native and Indigenous. Um, but 12% is super low uh, compared to our peers within uh, the tech industry, so you'll see that we're 76% um, white within the United States. And there are a few reasons for why that may be. So Red Hat is not based in California or on the West Coast like many other tech companies. Um, it was founded in North Carolina um, in the American South. We're headquartered in Raleigh. Um, and so that probably accounts for the reason uh, that it's not as diverse as you would see like, as a company that's based in, um, in Silicon Valley. You know? And so there is a historical context for why um, these numbers look pretty low compared to our peers. Um, and so because we are underrepresented <laughs> within Red Hat, uh, we felt like we had a really, really good case to start uh, employee resource group. Um, there were many instances where um, those of us who identified as part of the Asian diaspora were the only um, Asian and sometimes the only person of color on our teams. And so that contributed to, to feelings of isolation, um, feelings of 
uh, our teams perhaps not fully understanding the full impact of what was happening to us, um, particularly during COVID-19. Um, so just wanted to talk a little bit about the demographics of you know, what we consider to be within uh, the Asian diaspora. So it's really, really, really broad, right? Um, listed within this is not Central Asia. We actually included Central Asia because we had a few associates that came to us that um, identified as being from Central Asia. And so we included that um, within our um, definition of the Asian diaspora. Yeah, I'm about to get to that, Troy. So that would be like Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, um, that area. So it's like basically kind of, um, you know, adjacent to like Iran and Iraq. So it's the stands um, are, are what Central Asia. I actually had someone from Kazakhstan contact me about it. And actually my, my stepson was adopted from Kazakhstan. So I actually had a familiarity um, with Central Asia. Um, so we decided to go ahead and include that in there. We did not want to turn anyone away. Um, we felt like it was very, very important for people to advocate on behalf um, of their culture, to feel like there was a space where they could showcase um, cultural pride and identity. And we definitely wanted to feel like uh, we could provide that for them. Um, another thing to really understand about the Asian diaspora um, within the United States is that there's a really wide range in terms of education, um, a wide range uh, of socioeconomic levels, um, that it's not monolithic by any stretch of the imagination. And um, what we found um, within our company, and I think this is actually really, really common um, for a lot of folks who are part of the Asian diaspora, is that people don't realize that there are issues um, within the Asian community related to poverty and a lack of um, educational attainment. And um, folks find that really, really shocking. Um, and so there's a lot of education that needs to happen in terms of, of educating people about the fact that those disparities actually exist um, within what we call the Asian community. Um, also, the Asian American population is projected to become the largest immigrant group in the United States. Um, by 2055. And so we're already seeing the workplace starting to change. Like even in North Carolina, I've lived in North Carolina actually since 1991. I went to school there. And I've seen a lot of shifts in the past 30 some years in terms of who lives in North Carolina. Like when I first moved to North Carolina um, to attend um, undergrad at Duke, um, it was still very much a tobacco town. There was a functioning cigarette factory in Durham, North Carolina, um, and it was very Southern. Um, now it's a place that's characterized by a lot of transplants. Like it's definitely um, more diluted in terms of what we would call the Southern identity. I don't see that as much anymore. Like when I um, interact with folks that are within Durham or Raleigh in that particular area, the likelihood is quite high that they're not from the South. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about COVID-19 and how it's impacted um, the Asian American community. Um, but I also just want to recognize that it's affected the Asian diaspora globally um, very much. But I'm not going to address that here because that's kind of out of scope for this talk. Um, but for me personally, it's affected me personally. As I said, I'm of Filipino descent. And there are a large number of people of Filipino descent that, are, that work in healthcare. And we've been very adversely affected. I have family members that work um, as nurses um, who have been personally affected by this. And, uh, you know, and there have been people um, that have died you know, that I know. Um, but you know, the stuff that happened during COVID-19, you know, there was the stuff with, with obviously death, but it was also their accompanying racism. Um, that's always been there, but has been greatly amplified, um, particularly with the political rhetoric that was happening um, in the last year. It was super painful. Like I found it personally um, a source of really great distress, and as did the other members um, of the founding group. And we realized, you know, people actually don't realize how much this is affecting us at work. Like it just wasn't on anybody's radar. 
And one of the things that we realized um, as a group that even if we couldn't accomplish anything outside of just talking to each other, it was actually a real great gift to find each other, to have five people who were going through a really tough time given um, the context of the pandemic that we had the gift of actually talking to each other and saying, you know what, the issues that we're encountering are real. You know, there's so much validation in, in finding someone else who, who knows what you're going through. Like that to me is super, super important to have a space to have conversations like that. Um, the other part um, that came um, about as part of our conversations was this issue with the bamboo ceiling. Um, and this is something that people don't realize exists because um, as I said, there are a large number of Asians within the tech industry, but they're the least likely to be in, in management. Um, there's definitely a ceiling for people to get promoted. Um, and even you know, within the conversations I've had with folks um, within the Asian network, it's something that people have brought up and it's not something that's comfortable to bring up, to be honest, but we realized that we needed to do some advocacy um, in terms of promotion opportunities for folks within our community. So I wanna talk a bit about the challenges um, to the creation of the Asian network. Um, one of the things that was just really interesting was that when we uh, came together as a group to talk about creating this employee resource group, um, there were folks that actually said, why do you need a group? Um, because, you know, Asians are really successful. They don't need a group to talk to each other about stuff. Um, and so we really encountered um, this model minority myth in a lot of our conversations um, across the company. And it was um, really hard to deal um, with the model minority myth because what it does is it diminishes the real issues um, that we face as a community. It's like the issues that are related to racism, related to lack of promotion opportunities, um, the duress of, of worrying about our elderly parents living on their own and being fearful that they may be attacked. Um, then, you know, of course, there was the aftermath of the Atlanta shootings. Like all these things were, were coming um, upon us where there was so much emotional labor associated with dealing with these things happening and other people believing that there was nothing wrong. Like, you already have success, you're a success story, there's no reason for you to have an organization. And the fact that we actually had to say, no, we need this organization uh, because our issues are real, I mean, it spoke to the fact that there are so many things around invisibility um, around our community, um, and it also, tells you that this model minority myth actually doesn't do a service to anybody. You know, it's actually something that I would say is in service of white supremacy. Um, and that may sound radical to some people, but it is. It's actually a way of creating division. Um, and it's a way to, um, to keep the Asian community quiet because they should have nothing to complain about. But as you saw in the earlier slides, um, there's a great disparity uh, within, with education levels and socioeconomic levels within the Asian community within the United States. Um, another challenge that we had was a lack of formal support organizationally. So there were a couple of folks that were uh, working in a DEI space within Red Hat. Uh, we did have you know, an, an office related to diversity just recently formed, but that did not exist um, when we decided to start this organization. And so a lot of it had to be volunteer led and volunteer run. And so there was such emotional labor associated with having to create an infrastructure from scratch. And also with having to educate people about why the model minority myth was not something that was beneficial, was something that um, actually was very detrimental and not in service of the greater good, um, not just for the Asian community, but also for diversity, equity, and inclusion um, issues at large. Um, and then there were just some other things, these other layers related to being within you know, the Asian community. The fact that there was honestly some cultural discomfort with putting ourselves in the public eye, um, that's not something that we were really used to and it really meant having to put ourselves out there and it was kind of scary, um, particularly because one of the top issues that came um, to the forefront 
uh, were mental health issues that were arising within our community and trying to um, find ways um, um, to assist with those issues coming up. And then also, you know, there are issues with the fact there was the internalization of racism and, you know, how do we deal with the sections of uh, the, inter the issues of intersectionality with other groups because, uh, you know, past animosity, for instance, between the Asian and black communities. Uh, and of course, we were asked to do a global mission and it was hard to do it because we're all in North America, uh, specifically within North Carolina. And we wanted to, like I said, provide a united group for everyone who was there, including the Pacific Islander groups. We actually originally had Pacific Islander in our name, um, but there was feedback from associates in APAC that Pacific Islander was an American thing, and so we were asked to drop it. Um, but I still regret that we, um, we don't have that in our name, particularly because they had several Pacific Islanders <laughs> reach out to me, and they said, the Asian network does not acknowledge me by name. And I said, you're right. Um, Asians and Pacific Islanders are not the same, but we, because of our numbers, we uh, tend to do it as an umbrella group if people are wondering why that is. It's really actually because it's in, per in service of a political united cause. However, I, I want to talk about the flip side of why it was awesome to do this ERG, and it was the opportunity related to what the intersectionality um, that I mentioned earlier. So we ha do a lot of intersectionality efforts, and one of the intersectionality efforts that I'm really proud of is um, the work that we're doing with Blacks United in Leadership and Diversity, um, the BUILD organization, because we realized we, we wanted to provide um, an example of intersectionality first with the two largest underrepresented groups at Red Hat, and also because we wanted to acknowledge that there have been issues between um, our two communities within a, a national historical context. And we wanted to model that we could partner e with each other successfully and advocate for each other and raise each other up. Um, and so we have a joint workshop that's planned for both communities um, that we're gonna hopefully include our corporate leadership team on. So we're being really, really ambitious in terms of scoping this and also finding deliverables from the, these conversations that are gonna take place with the help of an external consultancy. Uh, we've also done joint um, workshops with the Native Indigenous group as well as with neurodiversity and we're partnering with all the other groups such as diverse abilities, pride, women's leadership community, UNIDOs, and the military veterans. Um, and so we've created all sorts of new relationships that would have never been possible by creating this ERG. We're here to celebrate each other, to amplify each other. Yes, it's also a space to express grief and frustration, but really we're here to lift each other up, to create success for people within the Asian community, within the Asian diaspora, but also for other groups who are not as represented. Uh, we feel like it's very, very important to partner with other groups and to amplify their voices too. Um, the one thing that applies to all of our groups is co colonialism, it's imperialism. So when people are like, okay, you're focused on the US, how does this scale globally? My response is, hey, every region in the world has been affected by some form of imperialism, some form of colonialism, some form of power system that's interested in keeping people divided instead of uniting them. Um, and so we're really interested in uniting people. So you can get this on the slides later, but here are a list of resources that we provide. Uh, we have a web page as well as a number of workshops that we've um, created. Uh, and then I just wanted to cite this um, report by McKinsey, and it cites an employee resource group as being really key to helping Asian American associates be successful. And so I wanted to put that out there and say, hey, you know what, that's actually been recognized as something that's really, really necessary um, for the success of Asian associates within companies. Um, and then I'm just gonna add um, with a slide uh, around diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. I won't read through it. You can read through it later on my slides because they're posted. Um, but just want to know, want people to know that um, we're really uh, wanting to make sure that we have a whole conversation about the authentic self. And that's really what diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice is all about. And so keep in touch with me. Um, this is my information. Um, I will be at the Red Hat booth um, immediately after this presentation if anyone wants to chat. Uh, you can connect with me also on Twitter and LinkedIn. And thank you very much for your time.
until you guys said something, and then I saw what was going on. Even though uh, my daughter's married to a Filipino woman, she never spoke to me about any of this stuff until I asked her. She's like, oh yeah, this is going on. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that I've found is that a lot of us tend to suffer in silence. And um, what the pandemic brought out was that we couldn't do that anymore. Like, it just wasn't a tenable situation to remain quiet about the things that were happening with ourselves and with our families and with our greater communities, you know. Um, and it was affecting us in the workplace because you're at home all the time, but you're sitting with all these things that are heavy. Um, and so how do you... Um, tell people this because it's like as an individual it's really scary but if you can do it as a group it's so much easier to say hey this resource group is talking about these issues and it's affecting me versus me coming as an individual um, in a conversation saying you know this affects me and people going oh okay you're just one person well you know we feel bad for you but this you know doesn't affect the rest of the team so um, you know, like we're not trying to be unempathetic, but it doesn't really matter to us. And that's what people were hearing, is that when they were trying to approach their managers or teams about the fact that they were worried about like family members, like maybe they were living, you know, somewhere on the East Coast and their family was in the Bay Area and there were a lot of tax going there. Like, how do you tell people, I'm afraid that my, you know, my parents are going to be attacked and possibly killed? You know, so there is also the issue of the secondary trauma um, that happens with incidents like that, even like if it doesn't affect you, it just, it stays with you and it resonates with you. Um, and it, and it does, it affects you and it's just, it's a cumulative effect. And it's also just amplified um, by everything that's going on. I mean, these issues have always been here, um, but it's the amplification of them that I think um, that finally caused, you know, the five of us to finally act upon this and say, you know what? We know we're not the only people going through this, and we want to make sure that people are seen and heard and that we erase invisibility. So, so anyway, thank you. I guess I need to unmic myself now because I'm done. Um, but come by the Red Hat booth if you want to chat some more. Um, I really appreciate um, seeing all of you here. Thank you. <laughs>